He was, among other things, a lead author on the fourth assessment of the IPCC, which he mentioned last night, which was uh, awarded uh, the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he is also uh, founded as the chief scientist for the Department of Energy Accelerated Climate Model for Energy um, and received the DOE Secretary of Honor for starting this. And he's also um, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for the Advancement Science, and the uh, American Physical Society. So very short introduction, reintroduction of Bob Hofstetter. Uh, just again, he was a faculty member. He joined the faculty at Stanford in 1950, formally retired in 1985, but actually was very active until his death in 1990. Um, very, very distinguished professor in electron scattering and gamma ray astronomy, uh, and actually in gamma rays and, and angiograms of the heart, which he also studied. So I have two anecdotes to tell you. In the early 50s, uh, Bob Hofstetter and Pete Fanofsky were asked to uh, give advice on an sec important security question. And the government wanted to know how to best detect nuclear weapons that might have been smuggled in via a suitcase or a box. And so after con deep consideration, they both concluded that the best way is to use a screwdriver and open the box. <laughs> <laughs> they they didn't really believe in all the exotic neutron activation things that people would you know, think of. If, uh, other I told, uh, I asked Bob at a faculty party uh, shortly after cold fusion was announced, which I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was an electrochemistry experiment. And I said, Bob, do you really believe this? He looked at me and said, you know, after I heard about nuclear fission, I'm willing to believe anything, <laughs> which was in 1938. So, uh, so he had a very wry sense of humor and, and is sorely missed. Bill, or is yours? Thank you so much. Well, I'm deeply honored by the opportunity to come speak to you today. And you'll see a couple of slides that I showed yesterday, but I'm going to describe to you in a, a way of uh, getting around needing to use climate models to make projections in the future. And this is a, a project that I have underway now. I don't have final results to show you, but I, I think what I'm going to describe to you is a series of developments um, that are a dream of the climate community uh, that was first articulated by Chuck Leith, who was a scientist at the National Center for uh, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, about 45 years ago, and we've now gotten to the point where theoretical developments, observational developments, computational developments have all converged to the point where we can actually realize that vision, and I'll, I'll share that with you a little bit um, later on in the talk. I'm first going to do a little bit of stage setting. And again, this will, some of these um, materials are, will overlap with the, pre the presentation that I gave last night to a general audience. But I think it's important for us to understand um, why it's important for us to be able to make projections um, faster than we've been able to do so far. And the, the problem is this, that we've entered an era where Climate change is occurring at a pace that is historically unprecedented. So if you look at the last 2000 years, basically since the time of the Roman Empire, there's been a, a very rapid rise in the Earth's temperature over a degree Celsius uh, since the invention of the uh, steam engine. And through a variety of, of mechanisms, including using climate models where we uh, can take human, basically set the effects of mankind equal to zero, humankind, and only leave in the effects of solar variability, which we have cataloged thanks to Galileo's work on sunspot counts back to the mid 1600s and uh, long-term records of volcanic activity. We can compare and contrast a world 
the observed world with humankind in it, and a synthetic world, a digital twin with no humanity, and those two no longer look like each other by the end of the uh, 20th and beginning of the 21st century. And that's what this graph on the right illustrates. Rapid rises in carbon dioxide. Uh, it, and these are now, the carbon dioxide is now increasing at the rate of about two and a half parts per million per year. So that's about six tenths of a uh, percent per year. I'll come back to that number a little bit later. Um, this trend is upward. Uh, and the IPCC is advising that we need to actually reverse the sign of this increase to begin driving it downward uh, fairly rapidly if we, if we can. So much of my talk is going to concern the energy budget for the climate system. And this is the, our, our current understanding of that energy budget. It's basically divided very neatly into input coming from the sun an output in the form of thermal infrared emission to space um, by essentially an accident of our orbit. The solar plong function, which is at 5,780 degrees Kelvin, barely overlaps with the Planck function uh, from the Earth. So to very good, uh, to essentially uh, one part in a hundred, the Planck curve for the incoming sunlight and the, out the Planck curve for the outgoing emission are separable, and that makes our job very, uh, very simple in terms of doing the accounting. And you'll notice at the top, and I'm gonna be focused a lot at the, at the top of the atmosphere in this talk, that to, uh, in this case, within a watt per meter squared, um, the net incoming solar, which is 340 incoming minus 100 reflected, so that's 240 net, uh, very closely approximates the amount of thermal emission to space, which in this case is 239. And we've accounted for roughly one watt per meter squared of increased greenhouse effect thanks to the, the uh, impact of humankind's emissions of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So it's, uh, constructing this budget um, is sort of the first step in understanding the climate system and the effects of perturbing it. And if you dig into the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which we issued in August of last year. Uh, this is the detailed accounting of how we've chemically, uh, well, we've chemically altered the composition of the Earth's atmosphere and those chemical alterations then translate into alterations in the uh, energy budget of the system. So this, uh, this is expressed in watts per meter squared. Positive on this axis indicates that the climate system is absorbing additional energy uh, and what this graph indicates is that we, uh, carbon dioxide is the primary player to uh, roughly 1.7 watts per meter squared and its increment to the energy budget. And then there are a series of other gases that add to this, for example, methane, nitrous oxide. There are some offsets coming from the effects of particulates, uh, in particular sulfur dioxide, which is released from the combustion of fossil fuel. Um, and the net effect of all this is to heat the climate system. Now, I should point out that this, uh, the numbers on this graph are a mixture of things. They're direct observations of the changes in the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere, combined with radiative transfer uh, models that have been applied to that chemical composition in order to infer the changes in the energy budget that I'm showing here. So it's a mixture of observations of concentrations combined with laboratory spectroscopy plus the theory of radiative transfer. And it's gonna be helpful in a moment, I'm gonna walk that, through that theory with you just to make sure that we are all on the same page with regards to where these numbers come from. So this, this figure compares and contrasts a world in equilibrium, which is shown on the left, and a world out of equilibrium, which is shown on the right. And one of the things I wanna come back to a little bit later uh, is that the primary heat capacity of the system resides in the ocean, which is effectively four and a half, uh, four and a half deep, a kilometer deep bathtub filled with water covering 70% of the Earth's surface. Uh, only 1% of the energy is being absorbed by the atmosphere. So to zeroth approximation, we can treat the energy that's being absorbed by the climate system as essentially all going into the ocean. And again, I'm going to evoke that uh, approximation a little bit later in this talk, 
where we construct a zero dimensional model of the climate system and ask how rapidly it will heat and to what temperature it will heat. So I'm gonna invoke this um, imbalance of heat capacities a little bit later as well. Okay, so one of the other things that I'm going to do throughout this talk is unscramble the, um, these broadband signals, signals that integrate over the entire spectrum into uh, their decomposition wavelength by wavelength. So we can look at the actual spectrum of primarily the outgoing uh, infrared radiation. And it turns out that this decomposition is exceptionally useful because it allows us to look at the, it allows us to separate the spectral signature of the forcing of the climate system by carbon dioxide from the broadband Planckian response showing up basically the change in temperature, which manifests as a shift in the Planck curve. So that's the response. And then there are feedbacks that get introduced on top of the forcing and the response, which can either be narrow band or broadband and show up in different parts of the spectrum. And it's for this reason that having a spectrum is incredibly helpful for both uh, quantifying those three different influences on the climate system, but also attributing them. This diagram on the left is thanks to work by Jim Anderson and uh, Richard Goody, both of whom are professors at Harvard. Uh, Richard Goody did a lot of pioneering work in radiative transfer. And also I believe during the second world war was responsible for going into Germany and looking uh, at their uh, work on nuclear weapons. This is when he was a much younger scientist. Uh, Jim Anderson has spent his career understanding the middle and upper atmosphere. And they partnered together to argue that we should be making detailed, long-term, uh, absolutely calibrated measurements of the Earth's spectrum so we can detect trends. And the reason they made this argument is that if you look at the, the a, uh, this is a simulated, but a simulated spectrum as measured by a satellite looking down at the Earth, you can basically tear the, the, the whole climate problem apart. So there's a distinct spectral signature uh, from carbon dioxide. And what, the way this is manifested, this, this graph is plotted in, in radiance units, but there's also on here, these dotted lines indicate the, the equivalent brightness temperature of a, of a black body. And so each of these curves, these dashed line curves corresponds to a, a Planck curve. And what you can see is that the, the planet, for the, in this particular instance, is close to about a 260 degree black body. But where there's carbon dioxide, the emission temperature drops. And that's because the atmosphere is emitting many fewer, uh, much less energy to space. And that uh, looks like a much colder black body. So that's the reason why there's a downward departure. And you can similarly see of places where, for example, ozone is acting as a prominent greenhouse gas, the effects of water vapor, which is also a very powerful greenhouse gas, but also is a feedback on the system. As you warm the climate, you evaporate more water from the ocean surface. The carrying capacity of the atmosphere is expressed using the classic Clapeyron relation, which goes up essentially exponentially um, with temperature. And so uh, the effects of that feed, both the greenhouse effect of water vapor and its feedback on the climate system show up at uh, higher wave numbers and so forth. And on the right is a, uh, some work done by Jim Anderson's group where they separately perturbed each of these, uh, each of these different uh, actors in the climate system. So you can see here the, separately the effect of changing carbon dioxide, changing tropospheric and stratospheric temperatures, changing water vapor and uh, we can uh, take measurements from space and do a similar decomposition on them. And I'm gonna use that a little bit later in my talk to argue why, uh, thanks to the fact that we have 25 years of measurements from satellites, we're in a position now to make um, what I think is an, 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 a new attack on the question of how much the climate will warm in the near future. Okay, so let's talk briefly about radiative transfer. This is. Um, where I spend much of my own personal research. You can take Maxwell's equations in a uh, form that's written in, in, in terms of Green's functions. It's known as the formula, uh, Lax formulation for, for Maxwell's equations. And um, through a series of approximations, turn them into a, a bulk transport equation 
uh, for spin one bosons. So this same equation applies to neutrons, for example, in a nuclear reactor. And in fact, we have had the, the field of climate and the field of uh, new, uh, atomic physics or nuclear physics uh, in a reactor have exchanged techniques to solve this equation. And what it expresses is a change in the uh, radiance, which is a, the magnitude of the pointing vector per unit distance in terms of a, a sink. Um, so this K here is, is known as an extinction uh, plus a source function. And the linearity of, of this uh, of the sink to the uh, radiance itself is very well established empirically. It also falls out theoretically from this particular uh, set of approximations to the Maxwell's equations. And one can show in, in the lower atmosphere, which is in local thermodynamic equilibrium, that the source function uh, is the Planck function shown here. And so we are now in a great position, since this is a, a, a ordinary differential equation, to solve it. And there's a solution. So the first term is essentially the decay of the boundary condition. This is known as uh, Beer's law, the Beer's-Lambert Beer's law. It's used a lot in remote sensing. And then there's an integral uh, term that involves the contributions of, say, the emission from the atmosphere to the upwelling radiation that, that escapes to space. And the quantity tau here that appears is a unitless quantity. It expresses essentially how many uh, radiative interactions the photon on average is encountered as it propagates to the medium. It's known in, in my literature as the optical depth. And one can uh, show analytically that the optical depth um, is positive indefinite with increases in, for example, carbon dioxide or other warm mixed greenhouse gases. It's positive when the frequency is inside the absorption bands and is approximately zero outside. And it's, you know, this is it's this piece of physics that govern that basically determine those brightness temperature curves I was just showing you a couple of slides ago. So when one can then also play this game with the radiance itself. So if we know the optical depth changes with CO2, we then propagate that through the solution to the radiative transfer equations and show that the radiance decreases or at least is neutral to changes in increasing concentrations of carbon dioxide. Um, and one can then ask, okay, great. So we know what the radiance does. What happens to these fluxes? The, expressions in terms of watts per meter squared, for example, that 239 number that I showed you um, very early on in this talk. So one can then integrate the radiance over the upwelling up hemisphere, integrate over frequency, and again, show analytically that this outgoing lower wave radiation, or OLR, uh, decreases with increasing carbon dioxide. And this is uh, sort of the simplest way of expressing the fact that uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It is only modest effects on the amount of incoming solar, but very large effects on the outgoing infrared. Um, and it's this physics that was discovered actually uh, in the uh, late, either late 18th or early 19th century that governs the, the, the way that uh, greenhouse gases affect the energy budget of the climate system. The yeah, all well and good, this is all extremely well established physics. Um, Steve and I were talking about smoking guns uh, a little bit earlier in terms of things that prove that we are altering the climate system in ways that are uh, pretty significant. In my field, this diagram is a particularly important smoking gun. This is work done by John Harries and his colleagues at Imperial College in London. And he had a very clever idea, which is you know, I've told you that the, the spectrum includes these, uh, the infrared spectrum includes these fingerprints from different greenhouse gases, and they're separated because the greenhouse gases act on different parts of the infrared spectrum. So if you had measurements that were taken very far apart in time, you could difference them and then ask, do I see the temperature, the uh, effective emitting temperature of the planet reduce as the concentrations of these gases increase? That's the prediction one would get from a model. And so what John Harris and his colleagues did was they took a, a satellite that was launched uh, a little bit before um, the start of the 21st century and compared it with an early satellite flown by um, uh, the uh, US Space Agency's, I believe some combination of NOAA and NASA, Nimbus 4. This actually uh, showed up in an early uh, movie by um, 
Michael Crichton, the Andromeda strain. So movie, there was some imagery very late in the, in the Andromeda strain, I think taken from Nimbus 4. You take the spectrum measured by these two satellites and difference it. Um, and what you get from a model is this prediction that the brightness temperature of the planet should have dropped by nearly two degrees Kelvin due to CO2, a little bit more due to methane. It's a much stronger greenhouse gas, nicely separated in, in wave number space. And what you see in the spectra, in fact, line up beautifully with these predictions. This is the first time that anyone had proven that we had altered the, the uh, energy budget of the planet thanks to greenhouse gases. This is the smoking gun for radio, expressing climate change in terms of radiative transfer. So fast forward to today, we can now start asking this question, not only at the top of the atmosphere, but also at the surface. So this is a very recent paper by Norm Loeb et al. And by the way, the, the QR codes on the, for the, if you, you're more than welcome to take uh, pictures of these slides. The QR codes in the bottom right-hand sides of these slides will take you directly to the source material for all the graphs that I'm showing you. Um, this is work by Norman Loeb, who's the chief scientist for the NASA series project, which is making measurements of the Earth's radiation budget. And so this red curve is from a satellite. And remember, I told you that the ocean is the primary uh, repository for this increased energy in the climate system. And this is the planetary heat uptake from in-situ observations in the ocean. And the, the, those two trends line up remarkably, again, because the ocean has most of the heat capacity in the climate system. From satellite, it's easy, uh, well, relatively easy. I mean, these are extremely expensive in instruments and complicated, but one platform will pretty much cover the entire uh, globe. From the surface, it requires a, a good deal more uh, legwork. And the in-situ measurements are being collected by Lagrangian drifters. So these are floats that are deployed in the ocean by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where, where I I started my career in climate after switching out of astrophysics. Uh, and you drop them, they sink, they drift down to a depth of about uh, two kilometers with the ocean, below the ocean surface and are measuring the temperature and salinity and currents all the way down and all the way up, come back up, relay this to a satellite and rinse and repeat. So they continue doing this continuously. Uh, when I took this snapshot, when I was preparing this talk uh, last week, this is the location of the nearly 4,000 drifters worldwide. So they just float the ocean currents and take these, uh, these measurements sort of serendipitously and have managed, as you can see, to pretty much spread themselves out over all the major oceans on Earth. And if you uh, sort of integrate this data over time, what it clearly illustrates uh, in just a span of about 15 years is the warming in the ocean column extending from the surface all the way down to two kilometers below the ocean surface. So a very clear trend um, over this time period. Now I'm gonna repeat uh, just for a second, uh, a couple of results that I showed last night. Uh, we've also um, been able to now demonstrate or sort of repeat John Harry's work at the Earth's surface. So I'll go through this uh, quickly because again, I, I showed it last night, but it's, we've been able to um, make the first quantitative measurement of the greenhouse effect from measurements thanks to the DOE Atmospheric Radiation uh, Measurement Program that Steve over, uh, oversaw when he was at the Department of Energy. So the, the Department of Energy may, has put in very detailed sensor networks in a number of locations around the world. Um, we're gonna use two of these networks that are located at this, in the uh, uh, central Oklahoma um, and also Barrow, Alaska. And the, the measurement that's really critical for the work that we're gonna do, again, we're gonna use a, a, a spectral measurement to pull this off, um, is an instrument called ARI, which takes, uh, looks upward at the atmosphere and makes detailed infrared me measurements of the downwelling radiation from the atmosphere to the Earth's surface. And what we will then do is construct a counterfactual with a model and in that kind of factual, we're going to hold carbon dioxide fixed, but let all the meteorological state parameters vary with time. Again, thanks to observations made from DOE arm. So the counterfactual essentially has the real meteorology 
but holds CO2 fixed. And then we can ask, what's the spectral signature of that we, what's, what do we get when we, when we difference the real data from the counterfactual? This is what we get on the left. Um, so this is from, sorry for these acronyms, this is the Southern Great Plains of Oklahoma. This is the North Slope of Alaska. Um, this is a simulations. Uh, this is model minus model. This is data minus model. The red traces on here, the red coloration indicate where this trend is uh, statistically significant. This double, this wishbone pattern is exactly the spectral signature that one would predict for carbon dioxide. This is known as the um, uh, P and R bands of uh, carbon dioxide. There's a forbidden transition in the middle and then an overtone band at slightly higher wave numbers. Uh, this is what we predicted, this is what we see. And then you can, uh, once again, spectrally integrate the signal as I indicated earlier and ask, what does this look like in terms of the uh, total uh, effect on the Earth's radiation budget? And uh, here's what you find. So here's rising CO2 concentrations at the Southern Great Plains. Uh, here's rising greenhouse effect, down relation to the Earth's surface. We can now repeat this at the north slope of Alaska. And we again find a rising uh, greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide at uh, Barrow, Alaska um, in line. And, and by the way, the, uh, the parameterizations for radiative transfer that we use in general circulation models of the climate agree very well with this very detailed line by line calculation that we performed here. One other thing that I, uh, that's intriguing you'll notice is on top of the trend, there's a sawtooth pattern. This is due to the natural cycle of photosynthesis and respiration that occurs every year. And the reason why it's, it's sort of asymmetric with respect to season is that most of the land surface and hence most of the, the large vegetative matter on earth sits in the Northern hemisphere. So you, you predict that there'll be an annual cycle to it. This is the first time that it's sort of net the natural greenhouse effect a photosynthesis minus respiration has been measured, again, thanks to the, uh, to the ARM program. I mentioned earlier that this is the primary greenhouse gas in the system. There's also methane. Uh, methane rose for a while, uh, and as shown on this left-hand left figure, then it stopped. This stopped during the fifth IPCC assessment, which I was also, I suppose, fortunate and unfortunate to be part of. And there were, the climate skeptics immediately leaped over the fact that it stopped rising and said, you're wrong, methane has stopped increasing. Um, well, right after we released the fifth assessment, it started rising again. We thought it would be extremely interesting to ask whether or not we could see this signal in the data. This turn, methane turns out to be a much, much tougher problem. I thought we would just take the, tech, the, the analytical techniques that we built for C2, apply them to methane, be you know, one and done, send another paper into, science or whatever, that uh, the signal to noise on, on methane is uh, instantaneously is about three to one. So it's not favorable odds. Um, and it, this turned out to be a much harder problem. In the end, we extracted the signal. Uh, and sure enough, what we saw, this breakpoint, by the way, is not something we put in by hand. We asked a, service, a, we asked a statistical model to tell us where the break occurred and how statistically significant it is. This breakpoint is we have exceptionally high confidence that it occurred here and that there is a break in the time series. As you know, if methane was not increasing, there was no trend in the greenhouse effect. This is the amount of radiation downwing from the atmosphere to the surface. And then it started rising right when the methane concentration started rising again. Um, and the other thing that's, now that you see the sawtooth powder in the data, this is due to water vapor this time, not due to any other effect, but due to, due to water vapor combined um, there's also a, an annual cycle in, the, um, in methane due to oxidation. So there's a different chemical sink. It's not it trees, it's uh, OH. And plus water vapor, uh, when the atmosphere is moist, it makes it harder to see the methane signal because it sort of lies in the same spectral region. Anyway, long story short, uh, we've now documented directly from observations for the first time in the wild the effects of methane and uh, carbon dioxide on the Earth's radiation budget. And you play the predictions out for future missions uh, and you ask climate models what's going to happen. The data and the models both indicate that this is where we've come. There's a linear trend between the temperature of the planet 
and how much you admit. And the question then is, how, how much more are we going to admit? Uh, and you can sort of see how much we've got left uh, in these blue bars. So uh, starting from now, if we want to keep the planet below roughly one and a half degrees Celsius, we can emit 500 gigatons more of CO2 equivalent. That's how much we've got left. And we're burning through that, by the way, at the rate of about uh, 40 gigatons per year. So you do the math, it's about a little over a decade before we blow through that budget. And then, you know, the, these other budgets get you higher and higher. One thing you'll notice, and the thing that I'm not going to spend the research part of my talk on, is that the, the uncertainty in these curves gets bigger the further you go out. <clears throat> and there's a reason for that. Um, and I'm now going to get to what's, what's going on there. So the, uh, what you were looking at on this previous, previous graph is what's known as the transient climate response. So it's the response of the system when you're driving it with a constant you know, increase in greenhouse gases and you haven't allowed it to come back into equilibrium. And climate scientists like to talk about two different measures of how the climate system will respond. One of them is known as transient climate response. And this is where you're driving the system with rising levels of CO2 that's shown in red here. And then you can also uh, take your foot off the gas pedal and let the system come into equilibrium and start measuring what's known as the equilibrated climate sensitivity or ECS. Um, and that's shown as T sub two X here. TCR is transient climate response and then ECS are the, are the green curves. The green curves are sort of a, almost a fiction because the ocean has an equilibration time scale of 3000 years. So the idea that you're gonna measure this is a, a little bit of a fantasy. Uh, what I believe is a much more useful measure is the transient climate response because we're, we're in a world, as I mentioned earlier, where we're driving CO2 concentrations upward by close to a percent per year, 16 of a percent per year. So this is actually a useful thing to, to try to quantify. Well, you might then ask, I, I just pointed out that the uncertainty seems to be growing. How well do we know either transient uh, climate response or equilibrium climate sensitivity? And the answer is not particularly well. I'm gonna come, uh, I need to first lay out some theory for you before I get to answer that question. So bear with me now, because I need to come back to that zero dimensional model that I mentioned to you earlier. So I can show you what the math is underlying, um, or <laughs> it's like two lines of algebra, but the math behind uh, transit climate response and equilibrium climate sensitivity. So as I mentioned earlier, the ocean has a lot of thermal inertia. And, and because the ocean is not isothermal, this takes um, the expression of, of this uh, lag due to the thermal response in the ocean takes a couple of forms. If you hit the system by doubling carbon dioxide, and this is work done by Ken Caldera, uh, with whom I had the pleasure of having coffee this afternoon, you see a lot of the response in the first decade or so. And then it, it, it ends get onto a much slower response curve that's due to the equilibration of the deep ocean. But a lot of the response happens in the upper ocean fairly quickly. Well, can we write down a theory for this? And sure, we can. We've got the first law of thermodynamics. We can apply this to a zero-dimensional zero climate system in which uh, I'm going to assume that the temperature on the left-hand side is for the ocean. Um, and I'm going to treat it as an isothermal system initially, oh, well, for the purposes of the starvation. Uh, and there's a climate forcing. So this is the change in the energy budget that we talked about a little bit earlier um, that I showed you those bar graphs for from the IPCC. And then the ocean responds by uh, beginning, it'll come back into equilibrium because it's going to heat thanks to the energy input. Um, and that heating we're going to treat as being uh, proportional to temperature. And of course, if, for example, you were to linearize the Stefan Boltzmann law about a, a, an initial unperturbed climate, this is exactly the expression you would get. In that case, alpha would be uh, four sigma t cubed, where sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So this works very nicely for the Stefan Boltzmann law. So we're going to uh, let's solve this system. Um, the alpha in, in the real world has a lot more going on in it than just the Stefan Boltzmann response. So we express this in terms of a change in the net energy budget of the climate system 
with respect to something that's changing. This could be the temperature of the air at the air surface, that's the Stefan Boltzmann law, but it could also be cloud cover. Uh, and there, there are a bunch of other terms that go into this expression, unfortunately, for which we do not have first principles theories. And that's really the rub here. Um, we'll come back to why clouds are so tough to solve in just a moment. Okay, great. So let's solve this equation. And this is what we get. The temperature is a lagged response to the forcing or the time scale that's given by the ratio of these these quantities of expressing heat capacity divided by the feedback parameter. So tau here is, is the time scale for this lag response. And you can imagine that you, you did just uh, set the forcing to a constant, let the system come into equilibrium. Here's the equilibrium climate sensitivity. It's the ratio of the forcing, which I've indicated to you earlier, we can now measure accurately from satellite, we can measure accurately from the ground. So the numerator in this quantity is actually something we nail down to some reasonable degree of accuracy uh, over the climate uh, feedback, which is where all the mystery meat is lurking. Great. Okay, so the other thing we can, we can now do is uh, we can ask, um, uh, it's, it's hard to run, you know, I just described to you as someone idealized experiment, it's hard to do that in nature, but we can certainly do this in the climate model. And I'm gonna essentially redo what uh, Ken Goldera did, but plotted a different way. So I'm going to take a, a, actually a, an ensemble of about 50 climate models, uh, jack up the carbon dioxide instantaneously by a factor of four, and then let them relax. And what you can then show analytically from this theory is that the net energy at the top of the atmosphere decays exponentially, again, with this time scale tau. In reality, we have both tau fast, that 10 year or, or so time constant I mentioned to you earlier, plus the response to the deep ocean, and when you, you plot this net energy budget at the top, that's uh, actually it's logarithm, but sure enough what you see, a straight line associated with the fast response followed by the slow decay uh, as the deeper ocean begins to equilibrate. Okay, now why am I laying all this out to you? I mentioned to you earlier that I, I think equilibrium climate sensitivity is, is nice. It's a metric that we use a lot, but it's also a little bit of a fiction. What's more, I think, more impactful is to be able to, to quantify transient climate response because that's the experiment that we are currently subjecting ourselves to. And one can relate, these two things, quantities are linearly related. Um, one can show from the theory I just gave you, um, plus the fact that the forcing for carbon dioxide goes, linear, goes logarithmically like the concentration of, of carbon dioxide. When you combine all these things, you can show that the transient climate response goes like the equilibrium climate sensitivity times a function, which is the ratio of the uh, time required to double carbon, uh, the time required to double carbon dioxide, if you increase it 1% per year and let that compound, divided by this, this constant tau. And this expression makes sense analytically. If you set R to zero, so you haven't waited at all, the transient climate response goes to zero. If you wait forever, you recover the transient, uh, the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So those two things become equivalent. Perfect. So. Here's the rub. We don't know uh, uh, the equilibrium climate sensitivity to roughly with a, uh, a factor of two and a half or so. Uh, and the same thing applies to transient climate response. They're both highly uncertain. You can try to uh, infer them from process understandings of the physics of the climate system, the instrumental record, emergent constraints, so things that are related to these properties. Um, you can uh, these blue crosses are from all the different climate models that we assembled for the last IPCC assessment. Uh, we need to know this number and we don't have it. And this has been true, unfortunately, since a national economy report led by Jules Charney at the uh, uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton that was done in the late uh, 1970s. So this has been a very persistent mystery. And I, I, I'm proposing that we now try to uh, deal with it. One last thing before, uh, one other important property before I, I uh, reveal to you what it, the way I think we can begin to solve that problem is I need to expand the, the climate system in one other dimension. We've talked about depth of the ocean and I need to expand the system laterally. So go from the equator to the pole. And this is to illustrate one of the other reasons why measuring radiation from space is such a singularly 
useful tool for getting your handle around everything that's happening in the climate system. So this is, these are measurements made from the predecessor to series that I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, this is the net solar input to the climate system. And of course it has this curve because of the, uh, in the basically the ge uh, geometry of the solar illumination of the planet. The equator gets more radiation than the poles. And the red curve is the net long radiation emission to space. And you notice that these, these uh, curves trade places. So there's more, the, the equator is getting a net surplus of energy. The poles are the radiator fins for the planet. And um, this actually has implications for the flow of energy in the system, as you might imagine. So you can write down uh, basically and, and, uh, write down the vector uh, equation for the flux of what's known as most static energy, which is the combination of thermal energy, gravitational potential energy, plus the latent energy of water vapor, which is appreciable. If you condense it, you, you gain back the latent heat of condensation. And you can I, I, so write two quantities related to this energy. One of them is the energy in the column, and the other is the flux of energy through that column northward. And then and one can then write down by combining an inductive derivative for these quantities plus the first law of thermodynamics, an evolution equation for this system. And uh, sure enough, uh, on the left-hand side is the net radiative input as measured by satellite into the climate system at any given long uh, latitude. And this tells you the time evolution of energy in the column plus a, a term related to the inductive flux northward. So if you measure the net at the top, you've basically characterized the zonally averaged room, uh, flow of energy radionally from the, from the equator to the pole. And this is the central energy flow in the climate system. So measuring, again, I'm arguing that measuring from space, this quantity is incredibly illuminating. And you know, if, you, if you assume that the system is in equilibrium, uh, if you know N, you can then in, infer this Mariano flux directly from this equation. So that's great. And this is what that, that uh, implied energy ocean transport looks like. It's about six petawatts at, at its peak in mid latitudes, close to where we are, this black trace. And you can also decompose it into terms of the atmosphere and ocean. Okay, so let's get back to trying to solve this mystery. Uh, why are these, uh, why is the, are these estimates so uncertain? I mentioned that the feedbacks are, are the source of the problem uh, and they're in the denominator. Uh, we can try to quantify each of these individual feedbacks. You'll be relieved to know that the Planck feedback, which is coming from the Stefan Boltzmann law, has a very small uncertainties associated with it. So does the combination with water vapor, because again, this is just cost of clap wrong. No mystery there. The, the big mystery in, in, uh, in terms of the feedbacks, and these are expressed in terms of watts per meter squared per degree Celsius, is as, are associated with clouds. And in fact, we're not even terribly sure of the sign of that feedback. So why are clouds hard? They're, they are uh, inhomogeneous turbulence. So it's turbulence acting with buoyance uh, against a gravitational gradient. And these clouds also have a heat engines inside of them, thanks to the condensation of water vapor to form liquid droplets, which releases, uh, releases the latent heat of condensation when you do that, which drives, uh, adds buoyancy to the cloud, drives the cloud upward. Uh, so this is uh, inhomogeneous turbulence with a heat engine, and it's an inherently multi-physics polymers, or, or multi-physics multi-scale polymers we'll come back to in just a moment. That's why we don't understand those feedbacks. These feedbacks also have spatial character to them. So, uh, and the clouds have this sort of fairly rich spatial structure. Again, this is arguing for making a measurement from space so you can capture all the spatial structure. If you try to do this from the ground, you'll be missing these very important gradients in the system. If we dig into clouds just a little bit more, this is from a paper that was released basically in conjunction with the sixth IPCC assessment. This sort of looks at the effects of different cloud types on the feedbacks. Um, actually, uh, we think that the biggest clouds in the equator as they may shrink in a warmer climate, that will allow more outgoing radiation to reach the space. That's the reason why that feedback is negative. Practically everything else, uh, clouds have the net effect of cooling the planet. If you burn them off, you will heat the planet. And that's what we appear to be doing. So that's why this feedback we think, you know, on average is positive, but we're not terribly sure about it. 
And you know, this is the sticking point, and this has been the sticking point now since uh, for a very long time, uh, as I'll come back to in a moment, uh, the, the mystery around how clouds are going to behave. Why are they tough? This is the comet system rendered in terms of uh, you know, this, a space-time diagram. Comet sitting up here at the outer scale. Um, so essentially the, the, the radius of the Earth, uh, 30,000 kilometers, so, so three times 10 to the eight meters, um, with time scales of, um, in, so they're, they're pi times 10 to the seven seconds in a year. So 100 years is three billion seconds. So, um, so that's up, you know, up here in the upper right-hand corner. You get down to turbulence and you sort of pulled uh, eight or nine orders of magnitude to drag yourself down to the lower left-hand corner. And you're still not done because cloud microphysics is occurring at length scales of um, micrometers to nanometers. So we've built this rich spectrum of comet of various kinds of models to try to emulate this behavior, um, but we're a long way from doing direct numerical simulation in the climate system as a whole, I can assure you. Uh, and this just illustrates, again, the other challenge, these, these clouds are short-lived, um, so they have time scales of under a day. Uh, and they also play uh, another imp very important role, which is establishing the equilibrium of the climate system due to the fact that the atmosphere is constantly and very persistently losing radiation. So if you, it, you know, I mentioned that the climate system as a whole is an equilibrium, but if you just consider the radiative fluxes between the top of the atmosphere and just above the surface, the atmosphere itself is, is losing energy uh, radiatively to the tune of about 100 watts per meter squared globally annually averaged. Well, that's not great for equilibrium. Where does it make up that energy deficit? It makes it up through a, a flux of heat and also water vapor, which then condenses and dumps heat into the atmosphere from the surface. Water is about 90% of that uh, makeup. And so the, the climate system creates equilibrium through a radiative convective equilibrium. It draws the water vapor from the surface, condenses it to form clouds. So that's the convective part. Um, and that dump of the latent heat of condensation into the atmosphere plus the sensible heat is what, what restores equilibrium in the system. This process is 10 days on the right. So we've got pretty fast time scales running on the problem, a lot shorter than the comet problem. So to put this in context, and I'm, I'm going to have to speed up here, I'm going to get to the interesting bits. Um, Several, uh, you know, two very important individuals got the Nobel Prize this uh, last year, Siki Manabe and Klaus Hausemann, um, for their work on understanding the climate system. Siki was doing his work at GFDL using computers that were uh, 10 billion times slower than what we have now, or 10 billion as of a couple of years ago, thanks to investments by the Department of Energy. We now have machines that produce a trillion times as many floating point operations per second. As the, as the machines that uh, Suki used to get his Nobel Prize. And we still have not solved the car, the car problem. So I'm gonna suggest that we need a plan B. And the plan B is to use the past to predict the future. So I showed you that we have estimates of tra transient climate response from climate models. What if we uh, were also able to derive transient climate uh, response from simulations and observations of the past? And let's just suppose for the sake of argument that these are, are linearly correlated. So we've, do, we've done our job well of, recreate, of essentially predicting from the past, predicting the future. And there's a range here because the climate models are over the map. But this is illustrating that we have a, ro a robust means of doing this estimate. One can then play the game of asking, all right, great, if I have satellite data and I use exactly the same analytical technique on it, um, then I can read out what the transient climate response is to some uh, much greater degree of confidence than I can currently get from a climate model. And it is this proposition that I'm proposing to you we need to undertake. Essentially, use the, climate, use the, the spread in the climate models as a source of strength, not weakness, to produce this large dynamic range over which we can test our ability to recreate transient climate response from climate models using this emulation of the past and then use that in conjunction with satellite data to get the number. 
So we're drawing strength from uncertainty. It's not a weakness, it's not a strength. So how are we gonna do this? Um, we're going to use fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, applied to a simple linear dynamical system that's being forced. And we're gonna measure the departure of the system from its equilibrated state versus the forced state. And one can show that uh, for linear dynamical systems that obey, that are Hamiltonian, um, that the, this forced response in the system, X here is a state vector. And I'm gonna argue in a minute that we can use the Earth spectrum as a state vector. We can write down the time evolution of this state as a convolution of the forcing of the state vector, and then some properties of the probability distribution of the unperturbed climate system. So this row here is the PDF of the, of the state vector in the unperturbed climate system. And you can then you know, make some arguments about what this does in equilibrium. The climate community has tried to apply this in the past uh, using work that Chuck Leith did, this paper that I mentioned to you earlier, but using Gaussian statistics. And Steve and I have been discussing problems where you can show manifestly that the climate system is anything but Gaussian. So this has been a, a critical limitation on applying the fluctuation dissipation theorem to the actual climate system. So this is where we were, you know, circa maybe about 10 years ago. Now, what has changed since then? Uh, the first is that we no longer have to assume Gaussian statistics. So there's been some very important theoretical work that has shown that you can use a technique known as kernel density estimation to get a, this uh, uh, probability distribution. And this is a, a standard technique where you so uh, essentially put a smoothing function around everywhere where you have an observation. This is the kernel. Um, so this, uh, this technique has been known for a long time. What's relatively new in the last 10 years is a way of rapidly inferring this kernel using fast Fourier transforms. And the, the word I want to stress here is fast. Uh, so that, this is a, a very efficient, computationally efficient way for estimating these kernels. Uh, and this is work that was done by a couple of gentlemen uh, 10 years ago, uh, where you could write down analytically what the Fourier transform of these kernels looks like. So once you know the Fourier transform of the kernel, you can then go back and reconstruct the PDF that's required to run the fluctuation dissipation theorem to get the forced response. So that's where all the pieces kind of tie together. My group has extended this to greater than one dimension, and we're in the process of borrowing some techniques from other fields of physics to extend this to dimensions considerably higher than one to avoid the curse of dimensionality. So this is one critical development that's basically brand new. It's, uh, we just did this, these theoretical extensions in the last five years. Okay, so the observables, spectra. Um, people have actually proposed this idea, uh, some work done by Richard Goody uh, was published in the late 1990s. At that time, we didn't have decades with the spectra. We do now, um, AIRS has been flying this particular satellite instrument since the year 2000 or so. Um, YASI, which is an instrument on board British satellites, essentially the same length of time. CRIS is a, another acronym for a new instrument that the NOAA is flying. Um, here they are. So here's the, the dawn of the air of being able to measure spectra from space, stitch them all together. AQUA is a NASA satellite that's flying as part of this thing called the A-Train. <laughs> Uh, this is the British instrument, uh, and now the new instruments on board NOAA, um, coming up on two decades with the spectra. Uh, and these, these spectra, you need these spectra, as I mentioned earlier, because there's a lot of variability that you have to be able to characterize at a pretty high duty cycle. Um, Richard Goody did, and I'm sorry for the quality of this graphic, he took the temporal empirical orthogonal function of spectra that he had at the time, which are pretty rudimentary, and found that the leading uh, EOF was due to clouds. And one can show that now using modern spectra. So here's the leading EOF taken from a recent uh, set of spectrographic data. And here's the distribution of clouds in the earth. And you can see that there's a great spatial match between the two. And what the nice thing about these satellites is that they're polar orbiting. So they actually observe every point on earth twice a day. That's what this red trace, this sort of looks, like, looks like the winding on a baseball means. So we're getting very high, the high temporal frequency that we, we need to be able to look at the rapid evolution of the climate system and infer its natural variability on, on the relevant internal timescales. 
The other thing that we have going for us is now this gigantic store of climate model data that I alluded to earlier. I won't go through this diagram in detail, but the climate community has built a uh, tens of petabytes large repository of data that's in the public domain called the Coupled Model Under Comparison Project. With a simple URL, you can start uh, fetching this data to your laptop. And in fact, I'm running jobs right this minute, uh, fetching this stuff to a computer center at Berkeley um, for various reasons, actually just to, to support this calculation. As part of this effort, um, the, uh, the climate community ran experiments where we held the system in equilibrium. So this is where I can infer my probability distributions for this, an unperturbed system from climate model simulations that were run for centuries with time invariant boundary conditions. We also have experiments where we were doing to the climate model what we're effectively doing to nature by rapidly increasing greenhouse gases. And also we've emulated the historical period. So it's all there. Um, and fortunately, a few of the climate models saved all the information that you need to do ready to transfer. Not many, but a few. And even fewer of them saved it at a daily cadence. So I'm confident I can do the calculation that I described to you earlier. I'm, I'm getting very close to the end of my talk, by the way. Uh, the last thing I, I sort of glossed over is doing ready to transfer off of a general circulation model. So the, state, the climate model is producing essentially all the stuff that goes into that optical depth that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, and also the information required to go into the Planck function. So you know the temperature and you know the, the, all the radioactive species going into the optical depth. So you can actually replace the, the uh, parameterizations in a general circulation model, which just produce these spectrally integrated solar and infrared fluxes with detailed calculations of the spectra. Um, and you can speed them up. So this is a clever technique developed by NASA for um, an instrument uh, on which I'm a co-PI called the Clario Pathfinder that's going on board the space station, where you use the fact that there's a lot of redundancy in the spectral information um, in these recalculations to replace doing them frequency by frequency uh, by doing them EOF by EOF, uh, essentially doing an empirical orthogonal function or singular value decomposition in the spectrum and just doing this at a few uh, uh, key points in the spectrum where, which control most of the variance in the signal that I'm showing you. And th these, these calculations are phenomenally uh, accurate and also 100 times faster than doing this uh, conventional way. My own group has done this. this is, these are calculations done uh, in support of the Clear Pathfinder mission. So we took GCM fluxes and reproduce them spectrally shown here. And we're able to just basically nail uh, the, calculate, the broadband calculations that we got out of a GCM to better than a percent. So this is doable, we know how to do it. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is the enabling technology is the uh, dawn of exascale computing, again, thanks to DOE. So uh, three machines, one of which is bordering on, uh, it actually will get up to an exaflop. If you do use reduced, uh, precision arithmetic. This is a machine that just got deployed at uh, NERSC um, about 100 yards from my office. And two of the machines that are coming online this year at Argonne and uh, Oak Ridge, both of which uh, clearly exceed an exaflop on the limb flat and the, and the limb pack spec. And these, this is all, these machines are all Cray, uh, well, H HPE, uh, um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise Cray supercomputers with the same software stack. So we, if we can run on one of these, we can run on all of them. An incredible uh, compute power. Uh, I mean, in, 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 if you think about this in terms of the equivalent amount of CPU hours, these are, these are 60 billion CPU hours per year uh, machines. They're a phenomenal compute resource. So my proposal is to now to attempt this calculation. We couldn't do it before. We didn't have the computers. We didn't have the data. We didn't have the theory. We now have all three. So there are a few things that I have not told you about. Um, we need to make sure that the linearity approximation is correct. We now have theory for that. We now have uh, theory, uh, I shouldn't say we, I mean, others have developed the theory that we will apply to make sure that we have the required number of time samples. Again, recent theoretical work on that, uh, using essentially by running the counterfactual against a very simple nonlinear dynamical systems. Um, we uh, now have theory to look at uh, at the applications of the fluctuation distribution theorem in systems that are under moderate disequilibrium, which is what applies to the climate system. 
Um, there's some other things that have to do with speeding up the calculation. So I think we're in a good position to actually try this. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your attention and look forward to any questions you might have for me. So thank you. So questions, please. You're mulling. Yes, please. You mentioned that these calculations are all being done in LTE. Is there anything like solar UV or particles or something that turns away from LTE and does it ever matter? Uh, so the question, let me, yeah, okay, we've got both mics on. So the question was, do departures from local thermodynamic equilibrium matter? And the answer is most definitely yes. So in the upper atmosphere, where the collisional frequency drops to the point that you no longer can support uh, local thermodynamic equilibrium, so upper stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, you have to use non-LTE codes. Uh, those are not particularly important uh, from a climate standpoint, modulo some, some details having to do with upper atmospheric dynamics, because what really sets the energy budget for the climate system is the net flux across the tropopause, the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere. And that's at an altitude where LTE still applies. So uh, um, modulo, modulo some details, no, it does not matter for the, what I just described to you. So how then does solar cycle So we, we can see effects um, from, um, there are, there are oscillations known as quasi biennial oscillations that do interact with non LTE radiative transfer. And these, these oscillations actually do propagate down and affect the troposphere. So that is a, a form of interaction between non LTE radiative transfer and uh, natural variability in the climate system that we can observe and is very well established. So, yeah, it does matter, but not at a level that I, I think is going to be um, for the purposes of looking, I'm, I'm looking down at, at a spectrum which is completely dominated by physics that's, remember I'm looking down, through an atmosphere with the, the vast majority of the mass is in local thermodynamic equilibrium. So what's dominating the, the signature, the, the spectrum that I gave into space is dominated by physics that's operating in LTE. But, but great question, thank you. Other questions for me? Yes, please. Rush a bit over your discussion of the non Gaussian TDS. Yes. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because obviously, things something non Gaussian allows, you know, an infinitude of possibilities, but you have in mind maybe some specific forms of non Gaussian energy. Or... No, this is a non parametric technique. Okay. So, the, the, the beauty of this technique is that it, it is, we do not have to make any assumptions about the underlying functional form of the kernel. Uh, what goes into the, so the, the theory here is that the Fourier transform of this kernel, which we're just, you know, it, it does have a specific analytic form, but that form changes from one implementation to the next. It's actually, the, the kernel itself is contingent on where the data is distributed in phase space. So it changes from one application to the next. The beauty of this theory is that one can write down an analytic expression for its Fourier transform and prove that that converges uh, to the correct answer under, you know, with an infinite number of observations. And also do show under idealized tests that it does uh, converge to the true PDF, but it is a non parametric technique. And that's what makes it uh, very valuable. We've tested it under a number of situations where uh, we've tested in situations where we knew the answer and we essentially fed it samples from the answer from highly non-Gaussian distributions and it recovered them. So uh, the, the idea of, of breaking away from, so uh, when I looked at the literature, there are two ways of tackling this problem. One was in one dimension to reformulate the fluctuation, fluctuation dissipation theorem uh, using Fokker Planck theory, uh, but the, the author was unsure how to extend this to higher dimensions. This technique works naturally in higher dimensions and we think we can take it to very high dimensions because we now have some tricks on how to deal with the integrals that we have to perform um, on phase spaces that may have hundreds of dimensions in them. So, but thank you for that question. Yes, please. Um, 
big satellite. We yes. And they're a spatial scale and temporal scale that goes into your model. How do you, how do you... This does <laughs> say. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. Uh, so the question was, uh, you've got this massive model satellite data that's actually being acquired at you know, ridiculously high spatial resolution. Uh, what's the necessary and sufficient spatial and temporal resolution to pull this off? Um, I'm, I'm going to, on the temporal question, I'm going to punt and just go with the highest resolution, temporal resolution that I can afford, which is daily. I don't have information from the, remember I have to run this test first on climate models. And the, the highest frequency data that, for which I have all the information required to run the radiative transfer is daily. And it's also essentially the repeat time for the satellite over any given, what's well, twice daily, but effectively the repeat time for the satellite over any point on Earth modulo a factor of two. So daily will be the time scale by default. The spatial scale, um, I'm still thinking about this. So I don't, I don't have a precise answer for you. My, I'm strongly tempted to take an average over longitude because that's essentially an, an irrelevant dimension in this problem. And as I pointed out earlier, the, the system, the primary energy flow is just being driven by radiological gradients in the, in the spectra as you go from equator to pole. So one thing I'm almost certainly gonna do for starters is take longitude out of the problem. And then we're starting to look at you know, an issue or a system where we've got maybe you know, 200 points running from pole to pole. And that starts to get tractable as a, as a problem for the, on which we can do analysis. Thank you for that question though. This is, that's one of the places where I'm gonna just wave my hands a little bit because I don't, I don't know the answer. The other natural scale that's gonna be set here, of course, is, is by the, um, I sort of, I don't wanna try um, saying that I can infer, you know, do, do anything useful with data at higher spatial resolution than the comet models that I'm gonna to use to test this in the first place. And those models effectively have resolutions of one degree in latitude and longitude, which is about hundred kilometers in the Earth's surface. So again, this gets back to an answer of about 200 points, pole to pole. Thank you for that question. Other questions for me? Yes, please. So at some point, sorry, I'm actually stepping out a little bit from, you know, from the larger point of view and also be one of uh, trying to find the remedy for all this and, you know, for climate change. Yes. And I have this idea that it actually one way or the other. Uh, uh -huh. is, is it too early to ask what what simulations and, and calculations uh, what role they will have in a uh, in full potential climate engineering uh, Thank you. So the question was, um, we if we have to well, assuming that we do have to go to uh, engineering uh, climate mitigation. So it, what's known as geoengineering and there, another term for it on, on at least in the solar side is solar radiation management, which is an amusing, amusing term. Um, the, then the question, the question was, do we have simulations that can help us uh, look at how well these techniques might work? And the answer is yes. Um, there is um, this, these large model and comparisons, they're known as MIPS in my world. And there's something known as GeoMIP, which is Geoengineering Model Inter Comparison Project. So we've experimented. I shouldn't say that. I'm using we here very loosely. I haven't done these experiments. In fact, I was very reluctant to do them. But um, the climate community has run experiments where we've introduced artificial volcanoes. And just so imagine injecting sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere for centuries. Uh, what, what, what effect do you see? Um, and sure enough, you can, you can definitely cool the planet and you can dial it up if you want to get to Pinatuba levels, uh, which is about uh, 19 million metric tons of sulfur dioxide uh, from one single volcanic pulse, that, that starts to get to an appreciable climate signal, a cooling signal. So we've run those experiments. Um, the solar radiation management experiments do suggest that uh, there's a, um, you can get to, uh, and actually, this is the, the title of a new science fiction book in which I play a minor role, Termination Shock. 
uh, by Neil Stevenson. I don't know if any of you are Neil Stevenson fans. He wrote the book Blade Runner, which is sort of the first, um, uh, you know, a really seminal volume uh, or uh, science fiction novel in, um, uh, in cyberpunk uh, novels. But uh, termination shock is what happens when you stop geoengineering. And what you see is that climate change comes roaring back on very short time scales. So this is very much a, you know, if you, if you decide to go down that path, you're committed to it for a very long time. Now, I, I, I don't know how much, I, I, let me just give you an, let me, let's now play out the string on, on Pentatubo for just a second. Because people talk about it as if it's easy peasy. Um, not so much. So the, I mentioned to you earlier that there are pi times 10 to the seven seconds in a year. And let's make the math easy. Let's assume Pentatubo did 15 million metric tons. So 15 million divided by 30 million means half a metric ton of sulfur dioxide injected into the stratosphere every second for centuries, okay? So half a metric ton, not so much. Well, but think about what that means in terms of delivering it up there. The payload bay of a B-52 bomber, fully loaded to capacity to the gills, is 30 metric tons. So you're now imagining a fleet of 1,440 B-52s, so one for every minute of the day. Uh, and every minute, a, one of these B-52s is dumping its payload into the stratosphere. This is what you're committing yourself to uh, if you wanna recreate Pentubo. Now, I've, I've had this discussion with startup firms that are arguing that this is fine and you're just off by a factor of three. I still argue that a factor of three here is, is you know, sort of quibbling around the edges uh, if you're looking at a B-52 bomber per minute, having to de deploy sulfur dioxide for a very long period of time. Um, so yes, the climate community is looking at this. Uh, other proposals have been to deploy a very large mylar disk at uh, the Lagrange point where the SOHO observatory is and essentially create an artificial sunspot. Um, a lot of the other ideas that have been explored have the disadvantage that they, they last very uh, short periods of time. So Britain, I think, and other countries are exploring kicking up sea salt to nucleate clouds. Those don't last very long. There's been talk about doing that over the Great Barrier Reef to keep the um, halt the degradation of the Great Barrier Reef. So Australia is now starting to look into this, doing geoengineering just over the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the simplest solution is to cut the cord between carbon dioxide emission and energy utilization. Um, and the, the other fixes are either very hard or are reasonably unpalatable. The last thing I'll say about geoengineering and sticking stuff into the stratosphere, um, the, the, one of the reasons why um, we were able to solve the, the ozone problem is that people realized that the catalytic chemistry uh, in the stratosphere that, that um, between COCs and, and ozone that degrades ozone is not occurring in the, free, in, the free, in the free air. It's a heterogeneous reaction occurring on the surfaces of polar stratospheric clouds. Um, and you know, this is what got a couple of people who discovered this into the National Academy at a very early age. So imagine now that you increase the reactive a surface area for heterogeneous chemical reactions in the stratosphere enormously by these chemical injections. We're not entirely sure what's going to happen. And I, again, I think this is, I mean, we can predict it, we can model it, but I, I think this is another place where the, the jury is still out and our, our models are not as robust as I would like them to be given the, how much we rely on having an ozone layer. So long answer to your question, but yeah, we're, we're definitely, as you can tell, we're definitely looking at it. Um, uh, I, I, I think you can tell from the tenor of my answer that we're, we, we don't see an easy way out there. Thank you. Steve. Those ocean current shifts that increase local weather. 
in a global way. So the um, yes, climate models now do a reasonably respectable job of, re of reproducing the uh, temporal power spectrum of El Nino and even getting the amplitude right. Um, there have been pretty successful theories based on delayed oscillators that were developed by David Patisti at the University of Washington and other scientists that laid out the, the theory for this a while ago. Um, and the uh, climate models have, uh, now are able to reproduce that phenomenon with a, a modicum of success. Uh, there are other, you know, other modes of internal variability for the climate system that we're still struggling to get right. But El Nino is is getting closer to, to being. I'd say we have moderately good emulation of it. We can't predict it particularly well, but we can certainly retrospectively simulate it with moderate accuracy. It's a great question. Oh, yeah, well, it's easy if you know the answer, right? Um, thank you so much for the chance to talk with you. I very much appreciate your questions and uh,